Hi guys, in this video we'll have an introduction to carbohydrates, we'll look at monosaccharides, glucose, isomers of glucose, ribose, and then we'll finish with a summary. So carbohydrates are an important family of molecules, particularly biological molecules, found in all organisms. And we describe them as organic molecules, and organic molecules, remember, means that they contain carbon, and they have a variety of important roles in the cell. One of their most influential roles is as a source of energy and a store of energy as well. So obviously all cells need the ability to produce energy to carry out various processes. And sugars are one of the foods that we eat to gather most of our energy. And carbohydrates can be termed as sugars as well. So we can find sugars in foods, for example, pasta. We also find it in rice and bread as well. And there's lots and lots of different sources of different types of carbohydrates. They also have a structural role in particular cells as well. So here we have a plant cell. And plant cells all have a feature around their perimeter known as the cell wall. And this cell wall structure adds strength and rigidity to the cell. And this kind of property allows plants to stand upright and grow very tall. A carbohydrate molecule, whichever type it is, contains only three elements, and they are carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So here we have an example of a carbohydrate. Don't worry too much about this particular example, but it is glyceraldehyde. And you can see it consists of only three elements. We have carbon atoms, hydrogens scattered around, and various oxygens too. But there's no additional element in this structure. And if you want to help remember which elements are in carbohydrates, you merely need to look at the next. We have carbo for carbon, hydra for hydrogen, and eights for oxygen, because eights usually refer to the addition of oxygen. So any example of a carbohydrate you come across, whether they be very small or very large, will only ever contain carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. So now let's talk about a type of carbohydrate known as a monosaccharide. So the simplest carbohydrates are called monosaccharides, and they're basically the monomers or building blocks for more of the complex carbohydrates. So remember, when we talk about biological molecules, we have individual units known as monomers, and we have monomers joined together into chains, and these become polymers. In this case, one of these units for a carbohydrate is known as a monosaccharide, with saccharide referring to sugar and the mono referring to one, and many of these can join up to form more complex carbohydrates in exactly the same way. So if we form two monosaccharides and form a bond between them, we then form a disaccharide, so the only thing that changes is the idea that we've gone from mono, which means one, to di, which means two. So here we have two individual monosaccharides. And in forming a bond between them, we have two monomers joined together, which is now known as a disaccharide. And if we were to add many, many more monosaccharides into a chain, we end up with more than two, three, four. We end up joining up to make a polysaccharide, where poly, as in the case with any biological molecule, means many. So this is the polymer of a carbohydrate. So if we had four monosaccharides joined together, each of them get their own bond between each monosaccharide, and we end up with a polysaccharide. So it's basically just changing the prefixes of the words. Monosaccharides have particular properties as these individual units. They're soluble, so they can dissolve, and they're sweet tasting carbohydrates. So they're also known commonly as sugars. So by definition, monosaccharides are single sugar monomers. They are the simplest carbohydrates. You cannot get smaller carbohydrates than these. And they have their own general formula as well, not to be confused with the general formula of general carbohydrates. The general formula of a monosaccharide is CH2O, so those three elements again, and then we put this all in brackets and we put N underneath. So this formula is basically saying that you have a certain number of carbon atoms and a certain number of oxygen atoms but twice the number of hydrogen atoms. So if you had a monosaccharide with three, you'd have N as three, three carbons, three oxygens, and six hydrogens. So this is the general formula for any of those monosaccharide single units. So bearing this formula in mind, the molecular formula for each type of sugar or each type of monosaccharide can be worked out just by using the formula. So we find the molecular formula, which is the actual number of atoms in the sugar, using the general formula, which is to be applied to any of them. So let's just go through each sugar, where we've got three carbon atoms, four carbon atoms, five, and six. So the general formula is CH2ON. So if we had three carbons, we would have C is three, 
H2, so that's 2 times 3, which is 6. And then O is the same as the carbon. And then if we had 4, we would have C4. H is always double this, so H8. And then we would have O4 again. So you can see the pattern for monosaccharides is there's always the same number of carbons and oxygens, but the hydrogens are double. For the 5 carbon one, we would have C5, H10, O5. And 6 would be C6, H12, O6. So what we've got is we've got different types of monosaccharides with different numbers of carbons. And what you can have is you can have a specific name for the sugar, like glyceraldehyde, 3Os, ribose, but you can also have a general term for any sugar with a certain number of carbons. So a monosaccharide that ever has three carbons is known as a triose. So you'll find that sugars tend to end in O's, just like glucose or fructose. Triose is a general term for any sugar with three carbons. And then a four carbon one would be a tetrose, just like tetrahedron has four sides. So tetra refers to any sugar with four carbons, like this one. Pentose for five, and hexose for six. And what we've got in this table are a few examples. So a triose sugar has three carbons, and if it's a monosaccharide, it has three, six, and three. An example of this is glyceraldehyde. So each of these red dots is a carbon, and you can see there are three of them. Each of those would be bound to various hydrogens, and so you can count the hydrogens, there are six of them, and then you can count the oxygens, of which there would be three. An example of a tetrose is known as threeose. Pentose is known as ribose, which we'll talk about in another slide. And the hexose, probably the most common glucose you've heard of, is glucose. So for any sugar that you're given, you can work out its molecular formula based on the general formula, and therefore it's a type of sugar known as either a triose if it's three, tetrose if it's four, etc. There's one hexose that we've mentioned here, which is glucose, but there are two other commonly found hexose monosaccharides, which you may have heard of, known as fructose and galactose. So remember, they're both still monosaccharides, so single unit carbohydrates, but they're both hexoses. So we've got fructose and galactose, and they're both hexose monosaccharides, which means they have six carbons in their ring, and so they're classed within this family. So there's a lot of levels here, but think about Hexos, etc. refers to how many carbons. Monosaccharides are the individual units of any carbohydrate. And then carbohydrate is the whole family. So just think of it in different layers. Glucose is one of the most heard of examples of a sugar, and it is a monosaccharide. And we describe it as a hexose sugar because it has six carbons. So if we were to look at the molecule here, we can see we've got one, two, three, four, five, six carbons. It doesn't matter what shape it is, if it ever has six carbons, it's automatically classed as a hexose, hence hexagon six sides. So it doesn't matter where the carbons are in any monosaccharide, however many carbons it is, dictates what type of O's sugar it is. And remember, we can work out the molecular formula using the general formula for a monosaccharide, which is CH2ON. So if we know it is a hexose, we've got six carbons, which means there are H2N, so 12 hydrogens, and the same number of oxygens, which is six. So the molecular formula for glucose is C6H12O6. Glucose is a really important sugar, and it pops up in lots of aspects of biology. It's the main source of energy in respiration for any cells. So glucose molecules are combined with the oxygen that we breathe in from the air, and it reacts to give two side products and one useful product. So it gives CO2 and water, which are both not really used much. And then it's also used to produce an important molecule known as ATP. And it's from this ATP that we get our energy. So glucose is important to carry out respiration. And this whole process of making ATP is what we call respiration. It's not only used as energy, but remember we said carbohydrates are used in a structural role too. It's the building block for larger carbohydrates. So in this long chain here, we have a polysaccharide, and the monosaccharides in this case are glucose. And when we have a polysaccharide of glucose arranged in this spiral structure, we have a particular molecule known as amylose, which is part of starch. So it's a building block for larger molecules. So in order to be suited for these properties, glucose is well adapted. It has particular features in its molecule that make it good as an energy source and to be able to build up into building blocks. So first of all, it's a very small monosaccharide, so it's easily transported in and out of cells, and it's done so through carrier proteins. So here we have the cell membrane, and let's say that this is outside of the cell, and this is inside of the cell. 
Specific proteins that are embedded into the cell membrane are called carrier proteins, and they're a type of protein in the cell membrane, and they can help take this glucose and transport it across the membrane into the cell. So this is useful if we want to take up glucose to carry out respiration. And because it's small, it's able to fit inside these carrier proteins quite easily. The carrier proteins change their shape in order to transport the glucose from one side to the other. It's also a very soluble molecule because of its size. So because of this, it's easily transported around an organism. For example, for us, it can travel in the bloodstream without any extra help other than being dissolved in water. It's not very reactive compared to some other monosaccharides, so the breakdown in respiration must be catalyzed and controlled by enzymes. So even though less reactive is normally a hard thing to get over, if the glucose can only react when it enters the enzyme, the enzymes can control how often this happens. So enzymes control the rate of respiration, which is really important. If we respire too much or too little, this can be a problem, and therefore, because they're catalyzed by enzymes, they're able to control this. Glucose also exists in what we call isomers. So glucose itself doesn't always exist exactly in the same way. It has different structural forms known as isomers. So in chemistry, an isomer is basically a molecule or molecules which have the same chemical formula, but they have a different arrangement of their atoms in space. So there are lots of examples of this, but if we take it in simple terms, if we had a carbon-carbon double bond here, and we've got two molecules which look very much the same, what we've got is we've got greens both facing upwards on this molecule, but on this molecule we've got one facing upwards and then one on this side. So overall, they have the same chemical formula, i.e. they contain the same number of atoms, the same groups, the same number of bonds, and everything basically is the same identically, but they have different arrangement of atoms, because now the green and the yellow have swapped over. So different arrangement. And you might be asking, well, why doesn't the green and yellow just swap around? And usually it would, but because of the double bond, it's restricted from doing this. So this only really happens in molecules where there's some sort of physical block to them just swapping over again. The double bond in the carbon means that these two won't ever swap over again. And in some sugars like glucose, we have the similar kind of structures stopping this rotation. And the number of isomers that something has is basically the number of different arrangements that it can exist in. So glucose itself has two isomers. One of them is called alpha glucose and the other is called beta glucose. And they differ by one single position of a hydroxyl group or an OH group. So let's look at glucose and its two isomers here. On the left side we have alpha glucose and on the right side we have beta glucose. They look very much the same but the only difference is that on this carbon here, the one on the right side, on alpha the OH is on the bottom and on beta, the OH is on the top. So it's these two groups that swap round on the carbon. And they can't just swap back easily because of these other bonds. Remember, carbon bonds to four things. So because of this strict rotation, they're not allowed to just change between them. So they're exactly the same molecules, six carbons and all the other groups are exactly the same. But the difference is alpha, the OH is on the bottom, and the OH is on the top. You need to know which is which, and sometimes the best way to remember it is that if you think alpha is that where the OHs are on the same side, on the beta they're on different sides, whatever works for you. And obviously that means that when we choose either alpha or beta glucose to build up things, i.e. different polysaccharides, they have different properties. So we can make different polysaccharides depending on whether we choose to make them out of alpha glucose or whether we choose to make them out of beta glucose as their building blocks. So remember we said earlier that some polysaccharides can have alpha glucose as a monosaccharide, and in this case we would have amylose. But in other polysaccharides we have the monomer of beta glucose, and an example of a polysaccharide where this occurs is known as cellulose, which is found in plant cell walls. So depending on what the monomer is, the polymer can be very different. Another important example of a sugar is ribose. Ribose is a pentose because it has five carbon atoms, and it's still a monosaccharide. So pentose refers to five carbons, and we can work out the molecular formula for this as it's a pentose sugar, because it's C5, twice the number of hydrogens, and then five oxygens, so C5H10O5. And if you were to count all of these up, you'd find that's what it is. So this is what ribose looks like. It's got a pentagonal shape, and it happens to have five carbons anyway. 
Sometimes the carbons don't always make the corners of the shape. One of the corners is actually made by oxygen, and this was the case in glucose as well. Where do we find ribose? Well, they're important in biology because they're found in a lot of important molecules, such as RNA, or ribonucleic acid, which is one of those nucleic acids used in transcription, and also found in ATP2. So RNA is a polynucleotide, and this is the ribose. And you can see there's repeating nucleotides all in a chain. And also in the molecule ATP, we have a sugar ribose, making up the main building block of the molecule. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you are looking for an amazing A-level biology resource, join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials. Just click the Snap Revise smiley face, and together, let's make A-level biology a walk in the park.